Hello, and welcome to the introduction of the golden flower. We are in a time of unprecedented crisis. There is no more time. In fact, we ran out of time maybe 30, 40 years ago. Since then, we have been signed up for environmental crisis. There's no way out of it, folks. It's going to happen. And it's going to happen to us within our lifetime. And most of the people on the planet are going to die. That's it. So the question now becomes, not what are we going to do about the crisis out there in the world, but what are we going to do about this crisis within ourselves? Because now we've already signed up for it. It's going to happen. The only question left is, how are we going to deal with it? How are we going to take it? What's going to be our attitude? What's going to be our state of being? I mean, everyone is going to die someday anyway. And we want to perfect our being, or at least reach the highest that we can before that happens. So there are so many methods, so many scriptures, so many teachers, so many different kinds of sadhana, etc., etc. Well, which one do we use? Which one do we which one do we take advantage of? Because there are many doors, 84,000 doors to the Dharma, according to the Buddha. So which one? Well, I would suggest to you that in this time, in this circumstance, we need the one that works quickly and gets us to enlightenment in the shortest possible time with the least amount of effort. That's why I'm presenting the golden flower. The golden flower is a very old method. And the interesting thing is, it doesn't belong to any one school. No religion, Taoism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, Muslim, takes claim to it. No organized school exists. It's completely esoteric. Yet, it's the most powerful and efficient method I know. In fact, I attained first stage enlightenment, first path, as it's called in Buddhism, through this very method, under the direction of Osho. And that's why this series is dedicated to him, that he helped me more than anybody to actually attain practical enlightenment. So if you don't care about organizational boundaries or ecclesiastical designations, <laughs> if you don't care about a position in some spiritual organization, and you just want to get enlightenment, this is the method for you. So why do we pick this one? Well, the traditional methods are too slow. They were. Of course they were. Especially if you're in touch with a realized teacher. They work just fine. But they're too slow. They're too complex. Our conditioning goes against it. We need something that's easy, dead simple, and fast. That's the golden flower. So, the secret of the golden flower is amazing because it promises and delivers enlightenment in less than a hundred days. There's just one catch. You have to be a hundred percent into it. You have to invest hundred percent of your time and energy for those hundred days. But what have you been doing so far? Playing around with this method, playing around with that method, going to this teacher and some other teacher, so the question is, 
When are we going to get sick and tired of playing around, being a dilettante, trying this and trying that, and really buckle down with one method until we make it? That's the big question. Don't we want enlightenment now? Do we want to put it off again and miss this whole life and have to come back again? And who knows what kind of situation we're going to have to come back to. Isn't it better to just bite the bullet, accept the quickest, most powerful method, and attain? That's my attitude. It's better to get somewhere, even if it's not 100% fourth path enlightenment, uh, even if it's only the first path. It's better to attain something now than to miss this life completely. Because especially now, who knows how long we have? Time is very short. So it's extremely urgent to get this message out. That's why I'm doing this series. I first heard The Secret of the Golden Flower from Osho in Pune in 1978 when he spoke on it. And it was later published as The Secret of Secrets in two volumes. And when I was hearing these discourses, I thought to myself, this sounds very familiar. Haven't I heard this someplace before? And of course, I hadn't heard it in that form. But actually, I had heard it from my Qigong teacher, Mrs. Yu. And Mrs. Yu was the wife of a very, very uh, well-known teacher of Chinese yoga, Chan meditation. And so after he died, she went on teaching, and I took Qigong from her in and around San Francisco back in the days, in the 60s. And of course, she was an extraordinary woman, and I could probably uh, spend a whole episode just talking about how wonderful she was. But what I want to get here is that the secrets of the golden flower were not passed down through Orthodox Buddhism and Taoism. Instead, they were passed down through the martial lineages, especially the Yang, Wu, and Chan lineage. So Mrs. Yu was a member of the Chan lineage, and I learned Wu-style Qigong from her, and also the secret of the golden flower was a theme that she wove through all of her teachings without mentioning it by name. So when she taught us to meditate, she was teaching us that method. I didn't know it. But when I encountered it later from Osho, it was very familiar. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, that's what that meant. That's what she was trying to tell us. Now I understand. Now, why wasn't the secret of the golden flower passed down through the Buddhist lineage? Well, I have to tell you something about Buddhism. In every case, when there was a choice, it seems like Buddhism chose in favor of the methods that were the least effective, the most complicated, the most difficult, and the ones that required the greatest qualification. And as a result, nowadays, Buddhists even say, well, in these days, nobody can become enlightened. Why? Because they have done everything to put roadblocks in your path. So, of course, they also don't become enlightened. <laughs> But the really powerful methods, like Secret of the Golden Flower, were kept alive by the martial lineages. And that's how I learned it, first encountered it. And then when Osho began to speak on it, that's when I got the chance to go deep into it. So how powerful? How fast? Well, after being with Osho again in Oregon, in 1984, I left the ranch. Things were getting really crazy there. It was a very difficult time for the commune. 
I left the ranch and I went to my apartment in Portland. And I just sat down and started to meditate. I didn't have any set method. I didn't have any particular goal. I just wanted to find out what would happen. So I sat down and waited. And gradually, I started to notice the phenomena that were spoken about in The Secret of the Golden Flower. And as I began to cultivate those phenomena, I became very interested in my inner life. I lost all interest in things outside of me. And I kept on meditating more and more until I was meditating sometimes 18 hours a day. I mean, I was young and strong then, so I could do it physically. But more than that, it was the interest that sustained me. Very interesting phenomena going on in the inner world that we're normally not aware of. And the secret of the golden flower is the backward flowing method, reversing the flow of the energy in the chakras. What does that mean? It means that normally, for example, with our sight, normally we're looking. That means the energy is going out. We're looking for something. We're looking for specific things that we hold in our minds as name and form. And when we encounter those things, we recognize them, and then we can do something or whatever we want to do. But our looking is an outward flow of energy, an outward flow of attention, an extroversion. As opposed to looking, there's seeing. Now in seeing, one simply relaxes. We're not looking for anything in particular. In fact, we're not looking at all. Simply relaxing and whatever visual stimuli come to us, well, that's fine. That's what we see. But we see without looking. We receive the visual energy, the light images. But we don't go seeking them. See? It's an inward flow. This is reversing the energy. And you can reverse the energy of all the senses, not just sight, but also hearing, taste, smell, touch, and the mind. They can be reversed. And when those flows reverse, we go from acting karmically in the world which brings a result of more karma and rebirth, going round and round on the wheel of birth and death. And we get off of that wheel, and we simply begin to be consciously, with no particular goal, no particular purpose. And this is very pleasant, very enjoyable. Oh, and by the way, it also leads to enlightenment. So, this is a one-step process. The one-step process is turn around. That's it. If you can turn around the energy flow everywhere, in every sense, in every chakra, you can attain enlightenment in a very short time. So, that's what this series is going to be about. We're going to use the original text, the uh, original English text, translated by Evans Wentz and commented on by Carl Jung. Now, there is another one, a newer version, a newer edition by Thomas Cleary. However, you know, I took a look at it before doing this series because I thought, oh, a new edition, maybe it's a better translation. He claims it's more complete, more accurate. But it's also unproven. I personally haven't worked with this edition, and I certainly didn't attain any enlightenment through it, and nobody that I know has either. So I'm going to stick with the good old Evans-Wentz edition because Osho used it. 
And when you go back and you look at the uh, Osho versions, I don't want to cause any confusion by using a different version of the text. So we're going to use the good old Evans Wentz a version, even though there may be some problems with it. But there were always problems when you translate something like this from one language, from one culture into another. So, in any case, the text is not sacred. It's not carved in stone, as it were. It's just a framework. It's just a set of terminology to help us talk about something that can't actually be described at all. We're talking about the inner life. We're talking about enlightenment. We're talking about what's beyond manifestation, beyond being and non-being, beyond birth and death. But this cannot be spoken of in words. It's an experience. Try to think of something you've done, like take a midnight swim in the ocean, or eating a beautiful meal full of all kinds of exotic flavors, or making love, or meditation. These experiences are real, but they cannot be described. You can say, oh yeah, I went down to the ocean on a full moon night and went skinny dipping. But does that really describe it? No, it can't. It's impossible. We don't have the words, huh? Those feelings, those sensations, there are no words. So similarly, enlightenment can't be described. But we can create a language that allows us to talk about the method, that allows us to approach the experience. That's the thing that really matters. So even though my words are basically nonsense, <laughs> All words are basically nonsense. It seems to make sense when we're talking about objects. But when we're talking about deep experiences, it doesn't make sense at all. For example, I just said that enlightenment by the golden flower method is a one-step process. Yet one of the first things it says in the texts is, don't try to go right to the end, but go through all the stages in order then you'll get it. <laughs> so which one is true? That it's a one-step process or that it's a step-by-step -step process? Which one is right? Well, the key here is that we don't take the text too seriously. Okay? We take the text as a framework, a conceptual grid, and then we can hang our words on that grid and see what the relationships are between them. That helps us navigate. It's like a map, that's all. A map of the territory. So just so you're not left hanging with that example I brought up a minute ago. Yes, it's a one-step process from the top. If you view it from the top, you see, oh, that was one step, cool. But if you're looking at it from the bottom, just beginning the process, then it looks like a step-by-step -step process. I have to do this, then I have to do that, and there are many small instructions that, when put all together, make one step. And when you finally get it, and you take that step, you get the result. It happens in a moment. And in the next moment, you know, I got it. There is tremendous certainty. There is complete knowingness. That's the thing about enlightenment. You know, a lot of people criticize me because I'm not an orthodox Buddhist or Taoist or anything. <laughs> I do things my own way. Always have. I'm an individual. And I have my own point of view on everything. I don't follow the party line. Not at all. In fact, if I detect that there is a party line, I go against it by default. Because you know why? The majority is almost always wrong. How is that? Well, 
let's just talk about IQ for a minute. IQ is a bell-shaped curve. You have the very low IQ people on one end, the very high IQ people on the other end, and the average IQ 100 people in the middle. So it's a bell-shaped curve. It goes up, peaks, and then goes down. So most of the people are in that bell, uh, that peak around the average 100 IQ. The really smart people are relatively few, just like the really dumb people are relatively few. Most of the average people cannot understand enlightenment. Why? They have been programmed against it. So to overcome that programming requires a certain amount of native intelligence. Either that or a lot of help and support. So automatically, the people who are average are usually wrong, especially about difficult and advanced subjects like enlightenment, meditation, spiritual life, and so on. Whatever the average person thinks is probably bogus. And that's a pretty safe bet. So when I see uh, people's attitudes and opinions about spiritual life, about life in general, or about me, I don't take it serious. I can't. Because I know I've had the experience. And I have complete certainty that the method works.